Hi everyone, my name is Renee Long, an ACHS webinar coordinator. Joining me today behind the scenes for all our technical needs is Dominic Aiello, also on the webinar te team here at ACHS. Today we'll be hosting a webinar from our master lecture series, and each of these lectures features an expert in the holistic health field from the ACHS faculty. It's my pleasure today to welcome you to today's master lecture webinar, Holistic Nutrition, Fasting and Elimination Therapy, presented by our own Dr. Jerry Cronin. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You may have noticed that your line has been muted. We are recording today's webinar and this helps ensure we can clearly hear our presenter. There will also be a brief 10 minute Q&A period at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions for Dr. Cronin as we go, type them into the questions box at the bottom of your control panel at the right hand side of the screen. I will write them down and I'll read them to our presenter at the end. If you have further questions that require a bit more research, please feel free to follow up with Dr. Cronin directly at jerrycronin at achs.edu. And that's J-E-R-R-Y-C-R-O-N-I-N at achs.edu. He's happy to respond to all of your questions, but please just give him uh, some time to get back to you. And now I'll go ahead and turn over our lecture to our presenter who will go ahead and begin the webinar. So welcome Dr. Cronin. You should now have control of the webinar and we are seeing your screen. I want to thank everybody for coming. I know it's early uh, in a lot of places. Um, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about elimination diet, holistic nutrition, and space, specifically the elimination therapy. A little bit about myself. I've been teaching here at ACHS for quite a while. Most of the classes that I teach are going to be the the uh, A&P. I'm in private practice. I am a chiropractor, so I do see patients on a daily basis. I, I love teaching. I love meeting people, obviously, and certainly the picture, that's me in the center, not on either side. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to basically talk about how elimination diet works, food allergies, and when we're talking about food allergies, we also have to rule out intolerance to food. We're going to discuss some of the signs and symptoms that we see and some of the ways that we actually test for the allergies. We're going to talk about uh, the elimination diet itself and then how we're going to, pro how we're going to um, challenge the, uh, the protocol. We'll mention some diets as far as that goes. And at the very end, I do want to touch on ADHD. This is a really hot topic right now, especially with elimination diets. And of course, there's time for our, our question and answer at the end. I do want to start out in saying that this is not a fad diet. We're not going to cut out carbs or anything that has the letter L in it or only eat cabbage soup or whatever as far as it goes. An elimination diet is a form of, of basically, I, I hate to say it, but it's almost like a form of medicine. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be challenging the body, seeing what we're allergic to or what we're not able to handle, and try to get rid of it, try to make ourselves better. I, I know this looks silly, but when we were younger, my wife and I, we bought a house. And in the house, there was this room that we really enjoyed. We'd been invite friends over. My son would play in it and things like that. And one day while my friends were over, they, they took the, the switch, actually, and turned it up higher. And here it's been on a dimmer switch the entire time. We were happy with it the way it was, but once the man turned up the dimmer switch, it was much brighter in the room. We realized that we had been missing out. We have been missing out on a lot of things, it seems like. And my question is, is this the way we're going through life? Are we just not all the way on just yet? And part of the elimination diet is that it's going to help show us that maybe, just maybe, this is what's happening with us. When we talk about a food allergy, what we have to do is we have to first figure out, is it actually an allergy? An allergy versus an intolerance, and we're going to talk about an intolerance versus versus a allergy a little bit as far as it goes. But a food allergy is going to be an actual response that our body is having as though we've gotten in touch with maybe poison ivy or we got a bee sting or something like that. So we're literally eating something that our body is saying, no, we shouldn't be having because there's a, there's a response to it that it's looking as though it's a foreign invader. Um, it, it says the food intolerance is usually are related to carbs and things like that. We find that food intolerance basically are carbs, but we are now starting to see that a lot of times the food intolerances are going to be a lot of additives that are going to be done. And we'll see that at the very end of the lecture. One of the big things with food allergies is that we do see a reaction, and oftentimes the reaction is systemic. It's over our entire body. It's not just on our hands or our face or whatever. 
but generally it will cover our entire body. And here, of course, it says that reactions can be severe, even life-threatening. So the difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance. Well, we said earlier, a uh, food allergy is a reaction to, of the immune system. So literally what's happening is that our body is looking at this food as though it's poison to us, as though it's a bad thing. It's, it's like us catching a cold, like us coming in contact with poison ivy or, or whatever. It's our immune system trying to fight it off the best we possibly can. A food intolerance is when our body isn't able to break it down. For whatever reason, maybe we're missing something. We see this a lot of times with like people who are lactose intolerant. They just can't break the lactose down. Um, the, the difference between the two, the food allergy is, of course, an immune response. Food intolerance is that our system is lacking something or it's not making it, not being able to break down the substance the correct way so that our body begins to really have problems digesting it. For a food allergy, first we have the exposure, no big thing, Just this is just like chicken pox or just like a, or almost any other disease that we can get here. We have the exposure, our genetics looks at it and we become sensitized to it, a re-exposure, and that's when the symptoms happen. Poison ivy is an excellent example of this. A lot of people say, nope, nope, I'm not allergic to poison ivy. First time they come in contact with it, they're fine. What happens is the body builds up a sensitivity to it, the next time they come in contact with it, they literally have the, the breaking out, the, the rashes, the itches, and as far as that goes. This is how an immune system generally works when we have an a, um, allergy reaction to it. When we talk about a food allergy, we, we recognize signs and symptoms. When we're in practice here, my patients, our clients are going to be coming in, we can see obvious symptoms like this. We see that the, the, this boy's back here is totally covered here. Or for example, just the, this tiny little marks all over this little child's body. These are obvious signs and symptoms that we have. This, this, these lips here, uh, they've, they've exploded almost as far as it goes because the person has come in contact with something that the person is allergic to. We're not going to see so many of these patients because these patients or these clients are going to be going to the ER or to the doctor's office. Food allergies, we have them here. Anything from a low-grade symptoms all the way up to life-threatening. We, we've seen these hives, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, growth, congestion, things like that as far as that goes. Down to the main one that we've all heard about, anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is when the entire body begins to basically shut down, close up. It's a life emergency as far as it goes. But my question comes in here, and this is how I brought it in with the light switch and everything. What if we don't recognize the symptoms as being allergies or allergic reactions? What if they're just so subtle that we just kind of overlook them or we just say these are the things that we're used to? Frequent urination, bed ready, hoarseness, muscle aches and pains as far as that goes, a low-grade fever, sweating, paleness, dark circles. Well, these are things that are often food allergies, but they're not strong enough to cause an allergic reaction that we're going to be jumping up and down, but it's just going to be annoying. These are the things that people, often your clients, my patients, are learning to live with. They just say, it's just a way of life as far as it goes. I've learned to adjust to it as far as it is. When we talk about allergies, when we, uh, we, we break it down into different things, and certainly different systems of our bodies are going to be attacked or, or approached. Um, for digestion, obviously, we're going to have things that are definitely directly related to digestion, the diarrhea, constipation, things like that, indigestion, belching. One of my clients, she basically constantly belched. She didn't realize that she was literally allergic to food that she was eating on a daily basis. She just thought, it's the way I go. She went to her doctor. Her doctor just basically said, yeah, it's just something we can't handle. We can give you drugs to calm it down, but we don't know what's causing it, so just get used to it type of a thing. We've seen these with the skin and mucous membranes, the, 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 the hives, the tissues, the rash, as far as that goes. And there's a newer thing called the oral allergy syndrome, and this is where basically the tissues around our mouth and inside of our mouth just basically begin to swell. They swell, they turn beet red, they become very scar-type scar type tissues as far as it goes. Our nervous system. Often when we think of allergies, we, we kind of ignore the nervous system as far as that goes. Migraines, headaches, uh, lack of energy. These are things that we look at and we kind of put out of our excuses, lack of concentration, irritability. We, we blame these on other things. It's, it's, not, it's too hot out, it's too cold out, it's too whatever as far as it goes. But the nervous system is certainly one of the things that are going to be affected. It's an immune response. When we eat something that is bad, it is an immune response. 
our body is trying to fight it off the same way that it would be trying to fight off a cold or a flu or whatever we might have. When we go to the normal doctor route, the medical route, what's going to happen is that they're going to do a couple different tests. The most popular one here is they do is a scratch test or the prick test. And literally what they do is they take part of the allergic, uh, the allergen, they're going to scratch it or put it underneath the person's skin, and then they're going to wait. If there's an allergic reaction right then and there, what they're going to do is they're going to say, yes, the person's allergic to, to rye grass or weeds or to, to milk or whatever as far as it goes. But a lot of times this isn't taking into consideration the specific type. The rye grass that grows around me is a lot different than the rye grass that grows in California or the rye grass or perhaps maybe the treatment that's being put onto it, the, the different chemicals that the farmers are using. This isn't taking into consideration. Same with milk. You've all probably heard of macrobiotics where we're trying to eat within a certain distance. That's the same way here. Each of these products are going to have different, different internal or specific structures or specific things that are going to react with our body. Test results. Uh, this is, look at this. Positive predicted accuracy of skin tests rarely exceeds 60%. Literally, 60%, that's not something that's good. So you can go to a doctor, they can say, yep, you're not allergic to anything, and yet when you leave, you're still allergic to that same thing that you're coming in contact with. And unfortunately, a lot of times, literally, they just say there's not much we can do. And that's where the elimination diet kicks in. The, the test results, they don't talk about food allergies. They definitely do not talk about food intolerance. And that's basically saying that our body isn't able to break it down. That's a whole different series of tests. All right. The uh, patient's medical history, the whole idea is there is what have they been doing? Where have they come in contact with? How often do they eat something as far as it goes? There's a lot of other tests available, but unfortunately, most of these tests, the patch test, the ELISA, the lactose intolerance, hydrogen, all of these tests are basically the same thing. There's very, very little, they're not 100% sure yet. They, a lot of times, it's a hit and miss because what's happening there is a lot of times when we're using the, for example, the patch test, we're not specifically using the same material that you might be coming in contact with. We're using a material that's close to it, that resembles it, but it might not be the exact specific item. All right. Now, no reliable skin or blood test to detect food additive intolerances. This is the problem we have here. We're adding things into the food where the FDA approves them or whoever the, the, the government approves them as far as it goes, and we're not sure whether or not there's actually an allergic reaction to them or not. Skin prick test for sulfates, sometimes positive, sometimes not, but we're not always 100% sure. I don't want my patient to be that one person that doesn't necessarily test positive. Best thing to do here, an exposure diary. Five to seven days, we have to write down every single thing that we've eaten. All the food, medicine, write down the time, what it is, save the labels if you're using that as far as that goes, and what happens, exactly what happens after you eat. How do you feel? How do you feel before you eat? How do you feel after? I know it's silly. I know a lot of people go to that. This is, this is time consuming as far as that goes. But this is the important part. We've got to figure out what you're allergic to or what you were having a reaction to. So for five to seven days, even longer if you possibly can, a very, very, very strict diet. The best thing that I tell my patients to do that if they eat something off the shelf type of a thing, a Twinkie or whatever, save the wrapper. Put the wrapper aside. We can look at it later, see what's in it, see maybe they're having a reaction to it. They bring in this, this exposure diary, and after they bring in the exposure diary, what we, what we start to do is we start to then figure out what are the suspected foods. Is it the food itself or is it something inside of the food? We'll look at the allergy test that they might have had, try to match the two of them up as far as it goes. But the main thing that we have to look at is what their reactions are to the food. Now, the problem here is that we're going to be putting them on a diet here, and if they're not really allergic to that food or they're not having a reaction to a food, why take them off of it? We have to make sure that their diet is full. We have to make sure that it's satisfying. They're not going to stay on it. If they like potatoes and they're allergic to potatoes, there's a problem here. We've got to figure out something else to do. And there's tons of alternatives as far as that goes. So once we figure out what it is, we're going to take the food from the diet. 
what we're going to do is we're going to say, this is the food that's causing the reaction. Let's try to do this. Let's pull it away. For the time being, we can use substitute if possible as far as it goes, but we have to make sure that the diet is nutritionally complete. It's extremely important. We don't want to be running the patient down. We don't want to be putting the patient or our client so hard that they don't want to do these things that they give up after the first few weeks or whatever. And what we need to do is we need to keep this going for about four or so weeks. So we've got to make it so it's an enjoyable. It's almost like any diet. The biggest problem with a diet is to keep the people happy and satisfied. And that's the same way here. If we're pulling out a food that they enjoy, that they like, we've got to find something to replace it with, something that they're going to enjoy, something that's going to make them want to keep keep on this diet. Yes, they're going to feel better maybe, but that potato chip is calling them or that soda is calling them or whatever it is as far as it goes. It's almost like an addiction. What we're going to do then is we're going to slowly but surely introduce what the food is that we think is wrong, that they've had a reaction to. Once we've introduced it, what we're going to do is we're going to keep a track of it. We're going to slowly introduce it. Now certainly, if this is a food that they're going to have an anaphylactic type shock, we certainly want to make sure that they're prepared for what's going to happen. We don't want to be just saying, yes, go out and eat a jar of peanuts or whatever. We certainly don't want to be killing our clients and patients as far as that goes. But what we want to do is we want to slowly introduce, reintroduce the food that they might be allergic to because we want to make sure that that's exactly what it is. And just small amounts at a time. And that's all. We have to create a diet for them. And like I said, we've got to create a diet that, that's going to be based on what they've been allergic to or what reactions that they've had as far as it goes. And you'd be surprised. The patient usually knows what they're allergic to. And they might say, oh, yeah, it seems every time I have soy sauce, I seem to have a problem. Or every time I eat Chinese food, I seem to have a problem. I get this bad headache. I get this bad whatever, spasm as far as it goes. What we have to do is literally patients and clients, they're not paying attention. They like things, and they're going to just keep doing it. They're going to go, yeah, but I like it, so I'm going to keep doing it. We have to find alternatives for them. All right? We put them on this diet. We keep them on this diet, as I said, for four weeks. Now, this diet, and I can't overemphasize it, it has to be nutritionally complete. It has to be, we have to be able to give them, make sure that they're getting full nutrients all the time, keeping away anything that they're allergic to. The last thing we want to do is start having a patient run down, but either physically or, or, or just being tired or not liking the food as far as it goes, because what's going to happen here is, is when we've taken out a food. They mention here a four-day rotation diet, which may be beneficial, meaning that, yes, what we'll do is we'll have a, we'll put the, put the food, the suspected food in there once in a while so that they can continue to enjoy it so that they'll still have it. I don't know if that's really the best thing to do as far as it goes. Um, maybe psychologically for the patient, it's going to be a good thing. But if we can just tell, it's like we've got to cut them cold turkey. It's like smoking cigarettes. Yeah, you might cut it down, but that person who smokes that cigarette once a week, you know, that one cigarette a week, that's not going to kill them, but it's not really good for them. And it's the same way that the body is still going to be creating an allergic reaction. It's going to create an immune response to their food, to them eating that food. Now, some of the things that we have noticed we put together here, and this is going to be listing some of the signs here with the next few slides, the signs and what we see they're related to. So cow's milk, soy milk, egg, wheat, as far as that goes, certain legumes, the peanuts, the soys, and the seem to be causing this, these hives, this emphysema, um, I'm sorry, uh, this, uh, they, they seem to be causing the, these hives that these children will get. We see it often as far as it goes. Um, just pulling out these products as far as it goes certainly might help it as far as it goes. Asthma, once again, cow's milk, eggs, sulfates, uh, benzoates, um, tyrosine, and other food diets, you're going to start noticing tartrazine located in a lot of the foods that we're eating now. They're using them in an awful lot of diets as far as it goes. As we're talking here and we're mentioning cow's milk and everything like that, well, I remember the story of how a lot of mothers will tell me that their child will be drinking milk or whatever, and at first they have a reaction to it, but they seem to outgrow it. 
really, is their body outgrowing it or is it just giving up? And, and that's the whole idea here with the elimination diet. Has our body given up on something? When a child's drinking a lot of milk and we just keep forcing it or whatever or anything and they're having a reaction to it, oftentimes the body just finally just gives up and says, oh, okay, fine, you're giving me milk, I'll take milk, no problem. It just stops fighting. Migraines, and once again, these are things that a lot of times people don't associate with food allergies. And fermented foods, fish, shellfish, improperly stored because the the shellfish actually improperly stored and begins to ferment on its own as far as it goes. Processed meats, alcohol, chocolate, things like that as far as that goes. Hives and facial swelling. Once again, we've seen this, the histamine, anything related to histamine. And that unfortunately includes some of the fruits, the citrus fruits, the tomatoes, the soy. We know how soy is a very, very uh, high allergic reaction. A lot of people have a reaction to soy as far as it goes. Here we're including foods with artificial colors. Um, children will often get these as far as this goes. We'll see this. And if they're not getting hives, maybe they're getting something else. Maybe they're getting something that's not as apparent. Carbs seem to cause diarrhea. Um, any of the things that are high in carbs, the, the, the potatoes, the pasta, even bananas. And I know that bananas are a biggie that we normally give to children who have diarrhea or to adults as far as it goes. And here's the oral allergy syndrome. And this is the thing that we mentioned. And, and this is becoming, we're seeing it more and more prevalent as far as it goes. And literally with the oral allergy syndrome, what happens is the inside of their mouth, sometimes their, their lips, but not necessarily, but it's the inside of their mouth that becomes basically raw. It becomes inflamed and raw. Uh, it, it, the children will say their, their, their tongue is burning. They'll say, or it feels like needles in their tongues as far as it goes. And it's things that we, we've all learned that, geez, these are good things here. Apple, kiwi fruit, look at them. The list, the potato. We're, we're giving these to children a lot, and, and that's okay. Not every, I'm not saying these are bad, but for some children that are going to have an allergic reaction to it, this is not a good thing at all for them. A latex allergy. These are the same symptoms that we have with a latex allergy. And a latex allergy, when we have that, is going to be obviously the hives, the, the contact dermatitis. But then what we're also going to have is we're going to have the swelling of the mucus glands, and that's in our throat, basically. That's the, the wheezing we're going to start hearing as far as it goes. And we see this, for example, the peanuts, the soy, the tree nuts, things like that. And once again, probably some of our favorite foods are there, the pineapples, the tomatoes, and stuff like that. But if we're allergic to it, it's just like coming in contact with poison ivy. Now, there's a big push right now on ADHD with children, and, and they've been finding, and this is one of the most fascinating things that I've come across, and they've been finding that a lot of kids that have ADHD, this isn't going to cure them, and I don't want to say that, a, that an elimination diet is going to cure them, but it's going to help control them. These are the kids that are overactive, that are hyperactive, that they, they just can't seem to keep their concentration, they... they they stay on something for a minute and then switch right over as far as it goes. And I, I mean, when we look at the foods that they're eating here, obviously most of these are certainly geared towards the kids, the bright colors, the, the, the things that we have never seen. I mean, naturally occurring, there's very few foods that are purple or some of these colors as far as it goes. But when we look at it, food colors and flavors are 80% of our foods have coloring and flavors added to it. And literally, this, they think, is one of the most common causes for the adverse reactions with children with ADHD. And I can't overemphasize it. It's not going to cure it. But if we get these things out of the kids, what happens is we notice that there's a big, big calming effect almost that they have. Um, colors and flavors, as you and I know, no nutritional value as far as that goes. They're simply there to sell the product. They want to sell the product. Now, the Kaiser Permanente, and these are the people, the, the, the um, hospital people as far as it goes, they started to practice with this. And at first it was laughed at because Kaiser Permanente is a very extremely large company, obviously. It's a big health care. And they started to say, wait a second, what's happening here is that these kids here, these kids that we're seeing with ADHD, 
are literally just maybe having a reaction to these these things that we're adding to it, adding to the food. So what their diet consisted of, they took out any food that the child had that had artificial colors, flavors, anything that had the BHT, BHA. And then they actually even took out apples that had the salicylate radicals in it. And they give an example here as apples, uh, pineapples will have it, things like that as far as it goes. They took it out and they did this fantastic study and they saw that the kids, 75% of the children, literally improved. And I'm not saying he were cured or anything like that, but they were improving on a short-term diet. They were giving it and it was a great test, it was a great study, a double-blind study, and 75% of the kids were literally having more attention span simply by getting rid of the artificial colors and flavorings and foods that they really didn't need as far as that goes. So what happened here was that their public policy actually went crazy here. And what happened is that the European Union said, wait a second, you're right. We have a problem here. These food dyes, these artificial colorings as far as it goes, we're going to treat this just like we would treat cigarettes, just like we're going to treat anything, and we're going to put a food, dye, a food warning label on the food. We want everybody to know, no big problem. We're going to say that there's, a, and they put the thing, this food may have an adverse effect on activity and attention in children. In the USA, uh, the FDA in 2011 had a same type of meeting. They fought, they argued, whatever. They said, nope, we're not going to take an action. We're not going to make that decision. 79% of the committee voted that no action should be taken. And it's kind of telling us exactly where our mentality is here. And I'm not saying that the European Union is any better or worse as far as it goes, but it seems that the U.S. is going to say, wait a second, we're going to be listening to the way that the food manufacturers are more so than the way that the healthcare are. Here's some references, um, and certainly if there's anything specific that you'd like to talk about, I'm more than or find as far as it goes, I'm more than happy to point it out as far as that goes. And um, are there any questions? We do actually have one question so far from Brenda. Let me just pull that up here. And she would like to know, here I'll just read her question. Um, she says, my question relates to how individuals how to individualize a detoxification for individuals who have chronic health conditions, specifically cancer patients who have finished chemotherapy and want to detox, type 2 diabetics who are taking an oral medication such as metformin. Um, most doctors would not recommend a fast or elim elimination diet, so if they ask their MDs, they would be advised not to embark on something like this. What are your thoughts? Well, we have a patient here, or, or one of our clients here, What's happening here is that they've just finished up chemotherapy where they're right on the verge of being ill. So do we want to push them down a little further or do we want to try to make sure that they get better first? That would be the big question that I would have. Now, a detox or a food fasting, I can see where the doctors, you really have to be in good shape to have a food fast. Uh, you really, really have to be in great shape. You have to be monitored. Somebody has to know what they're doing as far as that goes. If you're talking about type, you know, diabetic patient as far as that goes, we're having kidney failure here. Depending on what, what we're kind of a fast we're going to be doing, you know, that's going to be a fast. How much, how, much is, how much power is this going to be forced in the kidneys to be working just by doing the food fast? I could see why they are. I, I think that there's a lot more naturalists are coming around, uh, naturopaths that are coming around to saying, yes, we can start incorporating a part of a thing. But you have to remember, these are people that are on the verge of, they're, they're teetering right there on that little seesaw where if they go too far one way, they might not be able to come back. And I think that's what the main fear is. Uh, a detox, uh, you know, maybe if it's for two days, yeah, that might be a good thing. I, I don't know much more than two days. I, I know that detox, we should do them for three to five days, seven days as far as it goes, depending on what it is. Um, but somebody who's just finished cancer treatment, I, I, I'd be a little leery myself, personally. And I don't know if a lot of these patients that are going to really be able to handle it. You know, when they're very ill, as far as that goes, the last thing they're able to do is cut down on their nutrition, as far as it goes. I hope that helps. 
Great. Um, okay, so we have another question from Virginia, and she would like to know, can we add to your HDA, H, ADHD problems or triggers um, GMO products? I would certainly do that. We don't understand GMO right now. Right now, the, the U.S. Is, is up in the air about the GMO. Um, it's more public concern that's taking it, if you notice it, and I think it's a great thing. If we look at the way GMO is, and if you just do it like a search little, a short little search, um, we'll see that GMOs first came out, no big problem as far as that goes, and then what happens is that the people said, wait, we can't be having this, especially to children, and they stopped serving, basically, we're not supposed to have any GMO products in any children's baby food, anything that a child's supposed to be eating. It doesn't say anything about adults, and unfortunately now the GMOs are now going to be twisted or tweaked in the sense that they're not actually going to be, they're making them in the sense that they're not changing the genetics of them, or they're not changing enough of the genetics that it counts here in the U.S., I, I should say that. But GMO, I think it's a big hot topic right now. I think certainly if my child had ADHD or whatever, I'd be pulling everything I possibly could that would be unnatural away from him. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, that's definitely a, a hot topic right now. Um, so our next question comes from Linda, and she would like to know, do you have any suggestions for resources, resources on elimination diet recipes or menu plans to keep patients compliant? Uh, if you shoot me an email, I have tons of them. I have an awful lot of them. I have a lot of patients who are cranky patients <laughs> who don't like to have certain diets. And when you say to them, listen, we're going to take the favorite food of yours and pull it out, they look at me like I'm crazy, but I want them to get better because once they're better and once they're healthier, guess what? I'm, uh, they're going to put me in their will almost because once they've changed over, it's a great thing. But like I said, the whole trick with most diets is that you've got to have a big variety, and we see that with almost any diet. So, yes, if you shoot me an email as far as that goes, I'll give you tons of resources. I have more resources than I know what to do with as far as diets go. Yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, yeah, Linda, if you want to uh, email Jerry, his email address is jerrycronin at achs.edu, and that, again, is j-e-r-r-y-c-r-o-n-i-n at achs.edu, so you can shoot him an email. Um, and so our next question comes from Tracy, and she would like, well, it's more of a, a an add to, she says, not so much a question. Um, she says, a great book to further explain elimination theories is Breaking the Vicious Cycle by Elaine Gloria Gottskull. Um, it is, yeah, yeah Gottskull. It is right along the lines of what Professor Cronin was speaking about. So that might be a good resource, resource for all of you guys out there listening today. Um, and then, so our next and question. that's a great easy read book. That's a great book to take on the beach and read. Nice. Wonderful. Um, so our next question comes from Rhea, and she would like to know, I have taken a couple of different blood tests for testing food intolerances. Both came back with completely different results. One said I am intolerant to potatoes, and another said no dairy. I'm frustrated and confused. Is there a reliable way to test for food intolerances? Yes. Take it out of your diet. Take it out of your diet. Do it as an elimination diet for the next four weeks as far as it goes. Drop out the potatoes, the lactose, whatever it is. Try see how it is, and slowly but surely introduce back into the diet. But introduce one at a time. So take the potatoes, and I would take both out. If you're lactose and potatoes, I would take both out, and then slowly introduce potatoes. And then take that, and once you find out that you're not intolerant to the potatoes, then I would try the milk or the, the you know a lactose type of thing. But elimination diet is the best thing. You, it's a prime example. When they do the blood test, they go, yes, we're, we're going to check to see whether or not you're, you have a reaction to it or intolerant to it. It's just the cutting edges right now. And, and that's the problem is, is that we're not sure exactly how everything is working. So the best way is just take it out of the diet for a little bit. Yeah, that, um, that sounds like great advice. Uh, so our next question is from Catherine, and she would like to know, my, daughter aller my daughter's allergy list is long, and she is only two. They say by four she will grow out of it. Is this likely? She doesn't eat any of the foods she is allergic to. Now, <laughs> I love this when they say this, she'll outgrow it. Yeah, she could. 
she honestly could outgrow it. What happens is that the immune system then kicks in and says, we're okay with that. We're just going to have the antibodies, but we're not going to have the reaction. Um, okay, but being honest with you, is it that the body is actually outgrowing it, or is it that it's just giving up because we're just going to start giving her it, and she's just going to finally and surely, you know, slowly but surely, her body's just going to give out. If she's not missing any of the foods, does it really matter? I mean, I'm, I'm an older person here, and I've not eaten a lot of foods for a long time, and I haven't missed them as far as that goes. As long as they're eating foods and they learn to eat much better foods, it's like you and I. If we live here in the United States, very few of us are eating lychee nuts on a, on a daily basis because it's not, an air, not something around here as far as it goes. And that's the same way that we can look at her food as goes. Um, will she outgrow them? Maybe. You know, I would slowly but surely just introduce one at a time as far as it goes and see how it is. Um, but if she's happy without them, that's still good. I know it's a pain for us, but, you know, as, as being a parent as far as that goes, we're actually teaching them a better way to live. Okay. Definitely, definitely. Um, so our next question is from Kamel, and he or she, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, uh, would like to know, why do we take a diet for, only, for four weeks only? The idea is that in four weeks your body is going to be cleared of whatever that substance is, is in there. So if we take that diet for four weeks, we're, we're okay with it. We say, okay, let's say, for example, potatoes. So I take potatoes out of my diet for four weeks. My body's gotten used to it. It's clean as far as it goes. I introduce potatoes back into it, I can then see. And the introduction, it might not be immediate. I might have to wait two days to see a reaction or, or a couple, you know, like 48 hours before I'd see a reaction on the potatoes. So the four weeks, the whole idea between the four weeks is it's going to clean our body out. Great, great. Um... So we have another question from Marty, and she would like to know, my daughter has stage 3 spinal men meningioma, and she has had radiation after they removed 70% of her spinal tumor. How can I strengthen her body now and help her recover and begin to heal? Oh, boy. Um, you know, there there'd yeah. be a lot of diets that you could use for that as far as that goes. Um, depending on how old she is, depending on what she can do, um, yeah. That, I, I would definitely, I, I mean, if you shoot me an email, we can discuss it more in great detail as far as that goes. There's a lot of things that we can do to help her as far as that goes. Um, lots and lots of protein. I, I know it sounds silly, but that's the big thing, especially after having any types of surgery as far as that goes. I, I hate to put it off, but I, I don't know that much about her. But if you send me an email, tell me about her. I'll be happy to help you as far as I know. Wonderful. Yeah, and Marty, so again, um, in case you missed it earlier, Jerry's email is jerrycronin at achs.edu, so you can uh, make sure to get in touch with him. Our next question comes from Denise, and she, she was asking, once intolerance, uh, once intolerance to a certain food, say wheat, are you, are you always intolerant, or can you rebuild your gut flora with a diet like GAPS and then reintroduce down the road? It depends why you have the intolerance. If you have the intolerance because you're missing some enzyme as far as it goes, unless your body is able to rebuild that enzyme, nope, you're always going to be intolerant to it. If you're intolerant because of some illness as far as it goes, let's say I have pernicious anemia or I have some type of whatever as far as it goes, going on with macrocytic anemia in my stomach, well, then I'm going to be intolerant to an awful lot of foods. Once I have that macrocytic anemia cleared up as far as it goes, then I'll be able to start eating those foods again. The enzymes will be replaced. So yes, depending on exactly why you're intolerant or what causes the intolerance, are you missing something or is it just something that's a transient that's going on in your system at that time? Great. Um, here we have another question from Virginia and she would like to ask, my son is autistic and was not supposed to live past the age of 16. He is now 41. I changed all of his foods and vegetables and some meat. I have tried every natural source for elimination and none have really worked well for him. The doctor put him on Miralax. It is the only product that works well, but he has to have it every morning for him to eliminate regularly. I'd like to know if Miralax is safe in the long run or if you can make any other suggestions. Uh, I, is it safe in the long run? Uh, what happens there is that basically the body gets used to it. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's always there as far as it goes. Um, 
yeah, other suggestions. If you've tried everything, I, I don't know what I would be suggesting as far as that goes. Um, Muralax, that's one of the weaker ones or the easier ones as far as, as the uh, to help for elimination as far as that goes. But what happens is the body does get used to it. And that's with any of these. That's with any of these, basically. It gets used to it, so it's more dependent upon it. So taking him off of that is probably going to take a little more work if you were going to. Uh, long-term effects, I've never heard of anything bad as far as long-term effects other than a dependency on it. But I don't know if that's a bad thing if he's having such problems with it, if you understand what I'm saying. Great. Right. Um, our next question is from Douglas, and he would like to know, I would like to know if you can recommend the elimination diet to your chiropractor, or, sorry, let me reread that. He said, I would like to know, do you recommend the elimination diet to your chiropractic patients, and if so, what changes have you seen in pain management? I recommend it all the time. I, I'm a big, big proponent for it, only because I think that a lot of people are going through life allergic to things without realizing it. These little aches and pains that they have, these little problems that they have, those little phlegm in their throat that, throat that they complain about, the, the headaches, the tiredness at 2 o'clock in the afternoon as far as it goes, these are all, often these are all symptoms to allergies or intolerances. It doesn't hurt as long as we have a nice diet there. I say, look, all I need for you to do, we start out, the first thing we do is we start out with the whole idea that they make a, a diary. They, they make a list of everything that they're going to be eating, putting into their mouth for the next 10 days. I told you, as I mentioned earlier, if they put in anything that's commercial, bring me the box. I want to see the box because we're going to sit there and we're going to talk about it, see if there's an alternative uh, and, and whether or not that's it. Now, how do the people make out? Some of them, it's the best thing ever. They think that they have more energy. They, they've experienced more energy. They have less aches or less pains. They, have, they feel better about it. And other ones look at me as though I'm crazy saying, wait, I'm not here to lose weight. I'm not here to be, you know, be put on a diet as far as it goes. And they just kind of blow me off as far as, I go, as, far as that is. And that's okay. That doesn't bother me. It's those other ones that are coming back to me saying, you know what, I didn't realize that I was allergic to this. Or I didn't realize that I had problems digesting this. And now that I've, now that I've cut it out of my diet, I do feel much better more of the time. As far as pain management goes, it's usually, when we have an allergy reaction, it's usually going to be aches and pains type of things. It's not going to be real pain. It's going to be the aches. The, the muscles are going to be sore or the joints are going to be sore. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so our next question is again from Rhea, and she would like to know, how can one figure out the causes or cause for food allergies and food intolerances? The causes for food allergies is your parents. <laughs> it's, I'm still blaming my parents for my, my osteoarthritis. <laughs> um, you know, it's the only thing they've left me, um, the, the will just had, uh, had arthritis listed there, and that's it. Uh, it's <laughs> genetic prep, we're predisposed to this genetically, allergies, unfortunately. We can figure out which they are uh, by elimination as far as that goes. We can say, oh, okay, I'm allergic to honey. I'm allergic to this as far as it goes. Food intolerances, that's a different thing. It depends on what's going on. Uh, food intolerances a lot of times are genetic. It's been passed down to us as far as that goes. Uh, if, you're, if you're lactose intolerant, for example, that's one that we're familiar with. If you're lactose intolerant, that's something that your parents have given you. You can thank them, basically. That's a genetic trait that's been passed down to you. We can compensate for it by having non-lactose foods, and that's easily... Uh, and we see people with gluten allergies and things like that as far as that goes. These are things that are just being passed down uh, to figure out where it's come from. It's, it's our parents, basically. There's a lot of things. There's a, really a neat inter there's a really neat introduction to why we're allergic to peanuts now. And, and I don't have all the information, and I hate to say it, but it sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, nobody was ever allergic to peanuts. You could have peanuts on an airplane. You could have peanuts anywhere. You could throw peanuts in the classroom. Nobody was allergic to it. What happened apparently, and, and I'm, I'm speaking off the cuff here, apparently they've used a peanut product in our um, vaccinations. There's part of the peanut is actually used in part of the vaccination. When the vaccination is given to children, what happens is the body looks at this and says, okay, I'm going to react whenever I come in contact with the vaccine, but part of the vaccine the body's looking at is now peanut. 
So whenever the body comes in contact with peanut, it says, wait a second, this is the bad thing that I've been vaccinated against. You, you follow the logic there as far as it goes? So it's kind of interesting there. And, and that's how we see allergies starting as far as it goes. How my parents became allergic to whatever as far as it I I have no idea. But it's, it's genetics. That's the only thing we can do is blame our parents. Yeah, blame our parents, all genetics. <laughs> um, yes, so our next, our, well, let's, uh, this can be our last question because um, we're about to wrap up here. So this is from Marty, and she would like to know, my son has Crohn's, and I'm wondering what type of foods and diet he should include. Or what now, type of, you know, food and diet he should be, he should be adhering to. Right. Crohn's, they have their own special diets, it seems like, Crohn's disease. Uh, Crohn's is, is, is an offshoot or a cousin of, and I ha I'm not making light of it, of irritable bowel syndrome. And Crohn's disease, I would honestly work on literally almost like an elimination diet. And you've probably done that already with a child. You, you give them something and you say, oh, geez, he's reacting. He's bent over and you know cramping. He has diarrhea or he's constipated as far as that goes we're not going to give them that anymore. Uh, I would find what works, and that's pretty much you're doing the right thing in the sense of an elimination diet. You give them one day, you try something, and say, nope, he gets sick on that one, we're going to pull that back. We'll try it again in a month from now. So it really in the back of our minds, we're doing the same thing. Um, is there any specific diet for Crohn's? Um, I don't know of any specific one. I know that it's more individual. You've got to see what the, what they uh, you know what they enjoy and what actually works each for each individual child. Thank you so much, Jerry. This was uh, fantastic. I feel like I learned so much, and I'm sure all of our attendees um, learned so much. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it. So um, if you enjoyed this webinar, everyone, you should take a look at um, into any one of ACHS's many online courses and programs in holistic nutrition, which you can explore at achs.edu slash academics. Um, we offer online certificates, diplomas, and master's degrees in holistic nutrition, so be sure to swing by the website. And thank you, everybody, for attending this master lecture webinar. And just please keep an, e an eye out for an email, which will go out tomorrow with a free recording and the slides of today's webinar, so you can revisit it and watch it over and over again. Um, and please make sure to stay subscribed to the ACHS webinar email list to receive future announcements about our webinar series, and you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash edu and follow us on Twitter at the handle at edu for future webinar announcements, college events, and holistic health news. So thanks so much again, Dr. Cronin, and thank you everyone, and have a thank wonderful you. day.